So I'll just check this is streaming. Right, <coughs> um, welcome to this little workshop. I think I'd better bring some lights up. Ah, the lights are outside the door though, Okay, so um, somebody asked if I could put this on, on YouTube as well, um, and so I'm doing that, but it's not such a good quality because I'm not wearing a, a microphone, but I think you'll be able to hear it. I've got a little register here, I'm going to pass this around, can you just, I mean it's not a, a mandatory workshop, this is optional, but it's quite nice for me to know who comes. I always feel more kindly towards people when they're emailing me questions if they've been to the workshop. Is that wrong with me? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so could you just uh, put your initial against your name? If you were supposed to be attending the other group and you sneaked into this one, you just write your name then on the back because you won't find your name on the list. All right. I'm just passing it around. So just put your initials against your name, or if your name is not there, write your whole name on the back. So this is a... How are you all? Have you been okay? Because I haven't seen you for a couple of weeks. You all right? Everything okay? How are you? Oh, well, thank you for asking. <laughs> um, I'm all right, really. Yeah, sort of going backwards and forwards a bit. Um, Geneva is interesting. I don't know if you know what I'm doing there, but I'm basically... Um, I'm working at the International Bureau of Education for three months, which was a, a group that was set up originally by Piaget, and he ran it for 30, 40 years. But when the United Nations was born, it became part of UNESCO. And now it takes a, a big role in developing educational policy on a sort of global basis. Um, so it's it's quite small, there's only like about 10 people working there, but it's quite exciting just um, understanding, or trying to understand education at a sort of international level, which is very different really to what I'm used to. Um, so I'm learning a lot, um, and I hope you've been learning a lot too while I've been away. Um, this is an opportunity a little bit more intimate than, not very intimate, because there's still quite a lot of people in here, but a little bit more intimate than the lecture theatre, the tiered lecture theatre. Um, it is an opportunity for you to ask me questions about the assignment and for me to sort out as many um, of those as I, I can, really. So please don't be shy about asking a question. Um, it's probably the question that everybody else is asking, so you're doing a service by asking it now rather than coming up to me at the end and saying, I didn't want to ask because it might look stupid, but what are we supposed to do about this? You know, ask it, please, because um, I'm sure everybody else is asking that question as well. Um, so we're going to talk about the assignment. I'm going to show you some of the comments that I wrote on previous assignments, mostly mistakes that students have made, so you don't make them, that's the idea. Um, and uh, talk a little bit about writing about cause. So it's, I know that you're thinking about, well, you're probably thinking mostly about that test, but that test will be here and gone very soon. And so then you're probably thinking about the poster. But as well as the poster, I'm actually talking about the essay today as well. It's the poster and the essay together. I think that's, that's important. OK, so I'll, I'm going to get started. And, and as soon as you want to ask me a question, then please do. Uh, Okay, so now you know you've got this little multiple choice question 
examination coming up. Are we all feeling okay about that? Yeah. Good? <laughs> Good. So, no. Yes, slides, all, yeah, all these slides, good question, you see, good question. Already we've got a good question. All these slides are under assignment workshop on the, where all the other slides are on Blackboard for this unit. Now. Okay. They just went live this morning. Um, actually, you know, most students find this, this quite straightforward, this little assessment. You'll probably do it in about 20 minutes. A couple, uh, quite a few people have asked if they can have extra time. Of course you can have extra time, you know, we, we can sit there for, for our, well, Kate probably sit there for, for an hour, you know, or longer if you need it, but um, actually because it's multiple choice, it tends to be quite um, quick. Uh, the main part of the assignment, though, is not the multiple choice test, because that's just a matter of making sure you know the material that is on those two sets of slides, yeah, neurons and neuroanatomy, and what's the other one, learning and memory. Not the development slides. If we ask you anything about development, it's because it's on the other slides. Yeah. Neurons and neuron anatomy and learning and memory. Those are the two sets of slides you should be learning. But most of the assignment is not on that simple test. Most of it is on a, um, a topic that you're choosing from a list. Um, a learning experience, developmental disorder, or process that's pertinent to education, making appropriate and extensive use of terminology, principles, and concepts associated with the central nervous system and neurocognition. Central nervous system, I mean, we could, that includes the spine, but actually, really, it's about the brain. Actually, it can be a little bit beyond that, because sometimes you need to be talking about hormones as well, and endocrine system if you're doing emotion. But. To ensure all students are setting off with an appropriate topic and have made contact with some rigorous research in their chosen area, a PowerPoint post is required by 21st November. Since this requires a small amount of work, this represents very approximately 25% of your final grade. So, what I can't offer to do is to see a draft of your essay, unfortunately. It's just not possible with these many students. So, instead, what I've always done in this unit is to ask you to produce this poster. And this poster, uh, when you, after you've submitted it, within one or two weeks of submitting it, you'll get um, a little email back uh, with a few comments to submit to your poster. <coughs> Very occasionally, I say, actually not that occasionally, actually, quite a few times, I say, I would very much like to see a draft of your essay. That's because I'm slightly worried about something, okay? And it may be, it may be that you haven't quite made contact with the literature, or it may be because you're taking a particular sort of um, approach to your topic that's concerning me. Um, so occasionally I do actually ask specifically to see a draft essay, but generally speaking I, I, I can't do that. And the poster is there as an opportunity for me to check um, what, what you're doing, which direction you're going off with. Make sure you've got contact with the relevant literature to make sure you understand um, the, the basic brain processes that you should be focusing on. Um, let me just say something about the portfolio approach, because I've said uh, the test is approximately 25%, the poster is approximately 25%, the essay is approximately 50%. Why do I keep saying approximately? Well, because actually I'm not I'm marking it on a portfolio basis. What does that mean? It means I go to the master's criteria, because there are standard criteria for the master's course, which you can find in your handbook, against which all assignments are assessed. And I, and I see there, it says, I have to assess your learning and understanding. So I look for your learning and understanding in the essay. If it's not in the essay, I'll look for it in the poster. Sometimes I have to go back to the test and look for it there. You know, uh, but if, it, it means that you have, in a way, three opportunities. For me to show, for you to show me that you can meet the criteria of, for, for this um, for this unit, the general assessment criteria for this unit. So theoretically, that means it's possible for you to, um, you know, fail in the multiple choice test, but then do a wonderful essay, and you, you know you could you could still actually, I guess, get an A grade theoretically from doing that. 
because if, if in that essay you've shown this incredibly excellent learning and understanding and all the rest of it, it's because the, the, the test is really only going to show knowledge. It doesn't show a l that much understanding, because you could probably memorise all those slides and still not entirely understand them. The essay, on the other hand, shows an ability to think critically about your chosen area. So I look for different. I look at different parts of this assessment: the test, the poster, and most importantly, the essay, to find this evidence that I need to give you a, an A grade or a B grade or whatever. Okay. So it gives you the best possible chance to get the best possible grade. That's why I take a portfolio approach. Is that okay? Right. Um, so here are your topics, and I. Th thought, um, I mean, my difficulty is I'd love to let you all go off and do anything that you want. Um, it's, it's not impossible if you have a very strong desire to do something. I've had a couple of people email me and say, I really want to do this, and it's not on your list. Um, to one of those people I said, yes, I think that might be okay, and the other person I said, no, actually I don't think that's going to work, I rather didn't really, I think I could get you into trouble. Um, but th these are pucker topics. They're good topics to choose. And I'm hoping that, and, that, and they represent most of the topics that are, are chosen anywhere that students seem to want to do. So what I'd like you to do just for the next two minutes is that I'd like you to turn to the whoever's next to you, and I'd like you to tell them which of these topics you're choosing and why you're choosing it. And I suspect that will generate a few questions. Which I can then deal with. So just turn to your neighbour and share with them which topic you're doing and why. <laughs>
Right. <laughs> I should, I should imagine something about that. I've lost it. I should imagine that is sort of. Um, hello. Hello, everybody. Have you got a chair? a little discussion about your discussions because I can tell from the animated noise that um, you want to ask me some questions about it. Okay, so has anyone got any questions? Oh, come on. Right, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Kirsten, yeah. No, not necessarily. I mean, I, I, I had a couple of questions from, from this corner here about this as I was standing there. and um, <clears throat> So somebody was asking me, for example, uh, I'm really interested in early diagnosis of dyslexia. Um, and my response to that was, well, the thing is, if you're going to do the cognitive neuroscience, if you want to look at the cognitive neuroscience of the early diagnosis of dyslexia, because this is an essay on cognitive neuroscience, it's a review essay of, of what we know in the cognitive neuroscience of that topic. If you're going to do, if you're going to do early diagnosis of dyslexia, you've got to do all the dialect, dyslex, dys, you've got to do all the dyslexia stuff first. You've got to, because the basic dyslexia essay should, for example, start off with definition of dyslexia, you know, or the problems with the definition of dyslexia, um, the prevalence of dyslexia. Um, and then probably go on to discuss the cognitive neuroscience of reading before you go on to discuss the cognitive neuroscience of problems with reading, i.e. dyslexia. Then, if you've got space, you can have a little section at the end, or a big section if you've got a lot of space, but that seems a bit unlikely, because you've only got you know, 2,000 words. But you could then have a section on the early diagnosis of dyslexia, on you know, using um, EEG, um, and how that how that works and what that tells us about dyslexia. So that's 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 doable. You can you can have a little bit more focus, I think, in your essay in that area of that topic that's of particular <coughs> interest to you. Um, but sometimes it may take you way off beam into an area where there's not actually a lot too much research, and that's when the dangers arise. There's somebody who's asking me about high-functioning autism, and I'm thinking, actually, how much cognitive neuroscience is there of high-functioning autism? What's the cognitive neuroscience theory what, at the brain level of high-functioning autism? And I'm thinking, well, first of all, you're still going to have to go through definition of autism, prevalence of autism, um, probably look at you know, theories, theory of mind in terms of the brain, and then and there are several theories of, of autism. In, and, and there's cognitive neuroscience to, to back those up. So you're probably going to have to go to two or three of those before you get to the issue of high-functioning autism. Um, so you may or may not then get space for a little paragraph at the end. I don't know. And it depends how much material there is actually on that, how much we know about that, how many fMRI studies there have been, how many EEG studies, and, and what they tell us. I, I don't know. So I think, you know, you, you've certainly got space to focus and put a different a personal emphasis within these topics but you don't want to go too far off beam uh, because you're still going to have to cover a lot of ground before you get to that one specialist little bit of area that is of particular interest to you within that topic yeah Yes. <laughs> yeah. Is it really important to find a kind of conclusion that relates the neuroscience to the practice of education in a way that you you relate to the topic of the autism, for example? The the, edu the education link. The education link is not 
massively important. The most important link that you make in this essay is between the brain and the mind. And when I say the mind, I mean the cognitive concepts like working memory, you know, emotion, um, the psychology, if you like. So one of the, one of the major problems that, that comes up with some essays is that students are saying, um, oh, autism is about dysfunction of the amygdala, and look at the differences in these amygdalas in terms of their structure between those with and without autism. Oh, look at the underfunctioning of this region of the amygdala with and without autism. And they don't say, well, what does that tell us about autistic behaviours? And to explain that, you have to talk about what the amygdala does in terms of psychology, in terms of cognition. You know, so it's an emotional centre. It's very important for emotional reasoning and social reasoning. And therefore, you know, one theory of autism may use these brain differences to justify you know, the, a theory a cognitive theory of autism. So it's that link to cognition, it's that link to the mind, link to the psychology, that's, that's the most important bit. But some people might, for example, do... Uh, well, mind-wandering, I mean, you know, it's arguable. How, how relevant is mind-wandering to education? I think it's very relevant, actually. But I don't want you spending a whole essay applying what you've talked about here to the classroom. Please don't do that. All right. um, that, that, that's something you can do in your dissertation or uh, in issues in neuroscience and education if you do that optional unit. Um, this is a, 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 just a review of the science. Yeah. Uh, not entirely, no. If you want to, um, you can... I mean, I think it's healthy... I think it's important for you to acknowledge that the other theories exist. So you could say... You know... Um, you, you could say, well, one theory is um, deficiency in executive function, which may explain um, issues with cognition and um, underachievement and blah, 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 blah. Another theory is... Um, weak central coherence and and then and that might explain this and this but I'm going to focus on this theory so what and, and then and then really focus down on that theory I think that's absolutely fine the same with dyslexia or any other um, disorder that you decide to focus on you can just choose one theoretical framework if you want to but I think it is healthy to acknowledge the other ones exist to show your balance and show your awareness no you don't need to start giving um, Lots of um, you know pictures of, of, of brains and explaining what's going on or anything like that. No, no, just you know like two or three sentences on each one or something. Show your awareness. Um, yeah. Well, it's a real challenge doing it 2,000 words, but actually that's, that's the word limit on a nature or a science article, so I do appreciate, not that I write that many articles for nature or science, but, but you know, what I'm saying is it, it, it's a problem that you face in, in psychology generally <coughs> that we have to be concise. We have to make a decision about what's the most important paper to reference here, you know, um, what's the most important concept that we need to put forward and explain it. And that's really what I'm asking you to do. That's the most difficult part of this essay, is not finding, you know, it's not writing 2,000 words, it's not, you know, about your topic, that's easy. The difficult thing is trying to find the most important, the most important 2,000 words that should be said. Yeah, no, it's absolutely, absolutely, I'm going to emphasise that a lot. I think I probably need to move on. Um, any other questions about topics, though, before I... No? Okay, all I would say is, if your topic is not on this list, there's something that you really, really are burning to do, you can ask me. Um, I'm, my response may not be favourable, but it might be. Um, you know. Uh, it would be better if you asked me today, if possible, though. Because I have two, e uh, two inboxes now. I have a UNESCO inbox and a Bristol University inbox, so I'm finding it quite 
difficult keeping up both. So the poster I'm asking you to do on this template, uh, one of the reasons for that is, is really to sort of um, constrain you a little bit. But I think Katie Blakemore is going to, she may possibly revamp this uh, a little bit, I don't know, she's going to be talking to you about designing a poster. I mean, all I would say is, look at the word count here. This, is, this should not be an essay. Sometimes students are very naughty and they put their whole essay on here. That's, that's, that's really not what it's about. Um, it's about you making a decision about your focus. Your focus. If you're doing dyslexia, which brain regions should you be showing here? How, what sort of things are you going to say about them? Um, and actually, this is one of the most important parts of this poster, is the bibliography, because it tells me whether you're in contact with the literature. And if, if down here you've got up-to-date um, papers in good quality peer-reviewed journals, maybe just three or four references, um, and they're appropriate, and they're going to give you some prime information, maybe they're review articles, they're always excellent for this sort of job. You know, if you can find a review article, as, you know, a few review articles on your topic, then you're already off to a head start. Then, then I feel comfortable once I see those. What makes me feel uncomfortable is when there's a website address <laughs> to Dr. Smith, PhD, mm -hmm. who's rambling on about something uh, and with no references on his website, and I think, well, what is this guy talking about? Um, right, so, so that's why I'm asking you to sort of lay it out in this way. This is probably the least important section, the rationale for the chosen topic. It's interesting for me because I find out a little bit about you, which is quite nice. So if you say, well, I've taught dyslexic children for 10 years and you know, I, I want to know more. And that's quite nice for me to understand why you're approaching this, but um, it's probably the least important. This is an example of one that was done by someone called A Student. Um, this actually is probably a bit too much text on here already, but you know, it's okay, I'll, I'll let them get away with it. Um, nice diagram. I could do with uh, a little bit more detail, maybe a few more brain regions, but they're talking about uh, sleep and memory, and, and the hippocampus probably is the most important uh, region for that. So, And then the other thing that would reassure me on this is that they've got some, well, this is a very old example, but when, it, when, it, when they produced it, the, the references were quite up to date. Um, this is another one, a review of the cognitive neuroscience of autism. In terms of the diagrams, you know, you don't have to draw these yourself. You can, let's just go live on YouTube, isn't it? But you can, uh, paste them on, that's fine, okay. Um, the important, what I really want to know is that you know which brain regions you're talking about and where they are in the brain. That's what I really want to know. And so you can take a picture and then just put labels on it. I use paint quite a lot, which is the simplest graphics program that you've got on your computer. That's absolutely fine. You should never have brain regions labelled that you are not referring to in the text. Okay, so you know, get the old eraser out on paint and get rid of those labels because I, I really only want to see the regions highlighted and identified that you are talking about. <coughs> Right, so about the BME poster. So these are, let's, let's just talk about the poster because that's the first thing that you're going to be looking at. And here are some um, comments uh, that I wrote. Yeah, this is, this is really, actually, we're talking about a topic here. This sort of relates to the discussion that we were having before. So cognitive neuroscience of ADHD, fine. Cognitive neuroscience of dyscalculia, fine. Dyscalculia in its relation to classroom practice, not fine. Okay, that, I, that, that's not a good idea. I, we haven't got space in 2,000 words to be doing things that are beyond the scope of this unit. And this unit is not about applying, about applying neuroscience to education. Uh, and you know that's a subject which is close to my heart. So I'm very interested to talk to you about it. But in 
the unit called Issues in Neuroscience and Education. That's a better unit to talk about. This is about the brain and the mind, issues, uh, the science of the brain and the mind in areas that are relevant to education, but we're not applying it to education at this point. Okay, so you, have it, you can't do that in 2,000 words. Um, second language learning amongst adults with ADHD, that wouldn't be any good as a topic because it's two topics. Um, perceptions of dyslexia, no, this is about, you know, we, we don't want paragraphs in your essay about how people perceive dyslexia. It's a really interesting and important topic, but this is about the cognitive neuroscience of dyslexia, if you're going to do dyslexia. Uh, actually, this, this is um, treatments for ADHD. I'm not sure that that's an inappropriate topic, actually, entirely. Maybe I shouldn't have put that as not appropriate. The only thing is you are going to stretch yourself because you're going to have to do the cognitive neuroscience of ADHD and then go on to the treatments. Okay, so that, that's going to be a little bit more challenging. But I would, I would you know, you, if you wanted to focus down, that would be okay. Structural brain differences associated with OCD. Uh, that is... That wouldn't be appropriate. If you started just looking at structural brain differences, that, that would be really quite constraining um, because it's quite difficult to interpret those. You really should be focusing more on functional experiments, functional data, where we've seen the function of the brain change in relation to different conditions and it gives us insight into the function of the brain. Um, it's quite difficult to know what to make, for example, of structural differences uh, between brains of those diagnosed with and without dyslexia or ADHD. Um, the functional research is much more insightful. You can talk about structural differences, I'm, I'm happy with that, but you should really, the main focus is likely to be functional. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, I think it's important, and I think it's important to do that because it does contribute. Uh, it's just not good as the main focus. That's that's the point I'm really trying to make. Did you say the same for, um, for education? Because you said just now we're talking about um, what's relevant to education. Would, would it be appropriate to um, to comment on, on on the relevance, on how it's relevant? I, 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 that's that's fine a little bit, but it's not the main thrust of the essay. That's 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 the point I'm trying to make. The most important thing I'm looking for in this essay is that in contexts that are relevant to education, and that's kind of like almost every, every context really, um, that you can make meaningful, meaningful links between information about brain function, the, the neuroscience, and the mind, the psychology, the cognition. That, that's the crucial thing that I'm looking at. I, I'm not. I'm not sure how many marks I'd take off for you not mentioning it. To be honest, if it was a really good review of the cognitive neuroscience of ADHD, it's kind of like self-evident that that's important because we all know that you know. It's it's not. No, I wouldn't worry about it too much, really. I mean, I suppose there, there must be some topics. Uh, it's like if you. It, it, Psychosis, for example, I, I'm not sure psychosis is necessarily a an educationally relevant topic. So, you know, there are some topics that are not relevant to education, but but not <coughs> many, frankly. Yeah. Yes, but you could decide to focus mostly on. It, it, the thing about stress is, if you were looking um, at it just in, in children, um, you, you'd probably be a bit stuck in terms of providing a very clear review of the relationship between brain and mind for stress, because we've got many less child studies than we have adult studies. So, okay. So, the, um, Typical Marcus co comments, yes, do keep to your topic. This is something which I'm sure you all experience. I experience it myself. You're looking at the research. It's so fascinating. And before you know it, you're writing all these reams of notes on, on things which are not actually central and key to, to the topic. 
Um, and, you know, I know I can already feel that some of you have, oh, should I say, views or opinions or particular interests that you want to focus on. And, and that's wonderful because they motivate you, but be wary of them as well. This is an objective review of the science. Okay, so don't um, start using it to promote your own opinions um, but because that's, that's likely to undermine your objectivity. This is not an essay about your opinion, I'm afraid. I, I say that quietly because I know that in a way we're in an education department where it's all about becoming a critical thinker and developing your own arguments. But actually this is um, a scientific review. <laughs> and you know, and in science we, we believe there's only one objective truth. <gasps> See, I could be probably strung up for that <laughs> here. Because we you know, in a in an education department we believe in multiple perspectives. Um, there are many truths. But in science, we tend to be looking for just one objective truth, um, and so you need to have a have a way of writing which which is respectful of that. Um, it will not be possible in 2000 words to tackle questions such as is it possible to cultivate creativity, and if so, how? You see, that's something that I know is the sort of thing that many of you really want to know about. You think this is a great chance to find out, but it's a great chance to find out maybe about creativity or, what, or your topic, whatever it is, but um, don't, you know, don't take it so far as to think that this is an application. You, you, you can't look at applications. Um, Would you say to avoid questions as such? I would, I, 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 I just think, try not to think about how this applies. Yeah. Start, don't, don't tie yourself up with thinking about how it applies in the classroom. If you're really interested in that, you know, um, well, you might want to move to the, to the pathway of neuroscience and education, actually. Uh, but also, you can do that optional unit after Christmas to start looking at that. Um, stick to underlying processes rather than interventions, unless they crucially inform about the processes. So there are sometimes interventions that tell us something about the underlying processes. For example, with ADHD, um, methylphenolate was being used methylphenolate was being used before we really understood what methylphenolate does actually and understanding methylphenolate gives us some insight into ADHD because we know it ameliorates many of the symptoms um, and with dyslexia as well you know is dyslexia a brain based disorder caused by dysfunction of left hemisphere regions. Well, in interventions you can see the dyslexia being ameliorated. You can also see the underfunctioning brain regions being ameliorated as well. So, you know, clearly you can't say that this is some biologically determined dysfunction of that particular brain region if you can remediate it with education. So, sometimes the Interventions give you insight into the underlying processes, but this is not an essay about interventions. Again, it's, it's not an essay about a application. Uh, this is what I was trying to say earlier. It's really important to get the brain-mind story organised and to think what the brain-mind story is. Um, if you start talking about brain activations that are different here for children with this diagnosis or are different here when you're under stress, that's, no, that's only of interest if we know what those brain regions are supposed to do in terms of mental processes. Okay, so you have to explain why those activations are helpful in understanding your topic and this is this is very commonly missed out in, in this assignment um, and that's a real shame and then I end up writing things like this um, not clear from your discussion and diagram exactly what you are suggesting in terms of the relationship between brain function and dyslexia you haven't actually said why these differences of brain function are giving us any insight into dyslexia 
Um, yes, yeah, so this essay should, should link differences in the brain to cognitive differences. Um, do make sure you always explain in cognitive terms the significance of the brain regions implicated in your explanation and many other similar comments that you may find um, in essence. When it comes to the, the diagram, so this is going back to the post now, when it comes to the diagram, all and only those features you refer to should be indicated on the diagram and discussed in the text. Yeah, so there has to be, I don't want to see labels regioned on the diagram that are not discussed in the text, I don't want to see regions discussed in the text that are not indicated on a diagram. Because I need to know that you know where they are. That is important. Um, and otherwise, I end up writing things like, the relevance of many regions in the diagram are not explained. Where is the hippocampus in the diagram? Diagram doesn't include most of the regions you mentioned. You, um, you, what's this? you can't mark the corpus. Oh yeah, you can't mark the corpus callosum unless you have a medial section. So somebody was marking cortical regions from a view that looked at the outside of the brain, and but they were talking about the corpus callosum as well. And of course, you can't mark that unless you cut the brain in two and you look on the inside. So you needed another diagram, and they couldn't be bothered to do that. So they didn't know about that. Well, I noticed these things. So so please make sure. If you have to put in several anatomical diagrams to show all the regions that are involved, you know, it is worth doing. Um, are, is the diagram, are the diagram and the text detailed enough? Yes, because sometimes people will say, um, people will, yes, students sometimes will not really give enough detail of the regions involved, and they'll just say it's in the frontal cortex and then there'll be a diagram of the brain frontal cortex. Frontal cortex is a massive region it does all sorts of things I mean it's, it's a core it's one of your four lobes in the brain so it really only ties down what you're talking about it's tw to 20, well probably more than 25% of the brain so I still don't really know you know where this brain region is um, so you have to be quite precise Sometimes, if you're, if you're going to talk about different regions of the hippocampus, you're going to actually have to draw a section of the hippocampus and show where those are, you know, dentate gyrus or whatever. I mean, that, this is relevant to people doing stress, for example. Um, yes, yeah, so you need to be precise. Try not to be, try not to be vague in what you're saying. Know the limits. Um, in other words, what I mean by this is that you, you may well be, you may well get to a point where well, you should get to a point, all of you, where we simply don't know enough. And saying that we, you know, that that we still do not know these things, is the sign of a critical thinker. So you should be thinking critically and not giving me the impression that neuroscience can explain everything because it can't, it really can't, not in any of these topics in all of these topics there are things that we still do not know so please show that you know where the limits are and when you do that you have to be in contact with the most recent literature you know, if you, you can't say, but we still don't know the answer to such and such question and then reference Joe Bloggs 2000 I'm thinking, well hang on 2000, like 16 years ago, we might know the answer to that question now. You're going to ask? Uh, what was being told to be critical? In this essay, is it being uh, questioning to individual sources, or are we to assume that anything? Good question. Do is it, 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 what, what it means is um, showing balance. So if, if you tackle autism, that's why I said it's good not just to do one theory, but to show that you are aware of the other theories, even if you decide to focus on one. And then when you're discussing that theory, to make clear what the limitations are, bring in the critics of that theory and say, but such and such has pointed out that we still don't know this, or that this could be explained in another way. And another way that you can be critical is when you're discussing particular, um, particular studies, 
you will find that there are limitations within those studies. So fMRI, usually it's the temporal resolution is very poor. Usually these things are not longitudinal. Usually with ADHD studies, um, the participants may have other disorders. Also, they may be on medication. All of those things, or they may be just boys, or they may just be um, adults. You know, there's always going to be a limitation in terms of how far you can interpret what's going on. And, and, and bringing those in and making us aware of what we don't know, the limits on the studies, the other theories that are competing, you know, that give us some sense of the debate that's going on. That's critical. Um, explain jargon. Yeah, so somebody talked about the, the uh, I think a Gnostic, Gnostic cortex, and I've never heard of it. Uh, I think, it, and I had to go and look it up. Um, but there are actually more technical things than that that people bring up. Um, like proactive interference, interference resolution. Now, I do know what those mean, but I'm thinking, do you know what they mean? Um, so please try, do try to explain so I can be sure of your understanding. Have you found the best papers? Well, I've already said published reviews are really, really helpful. Not just because they bring you into contact with a lot of very rich literature, but also because they give you a sort of an outline or a, stru or a way of structuring your own essays quite often, or, or at least something to work from. Um, I mean, where should you start in trying to explain the cognitive neuroscience of ADHD? Uh, there, there are different ways of going about it. You might begin with how the construct, how the, the word, the phrase ADHD, or, or the, you know, the whole idea, um, began, you might go historically and talk about the way in which ADHD, the construct of ADHD is developed, um, beginning as a, a psychological construct and then you know, the neuroscience gets involved, uh, pharmaceutical <laughs> industries get involved, um, the, you know, that, that, or you might decide, which is probably a better idea, uh, to look at some of the diversity of brain regions that are involved and then present uh, a theory that can explain these um, because under-functioning of, uh, of dopamine, do dopamine deficit theory gives you a, an insight into how an underlying system, the reward system, may be failing which would then give rise to all these different cortical regions that are under functioning as well. And actually, they could afford to be different in different individuals if it's the same underlying system that's involved, the same underlying reward system issue. So, um, you know, then, then, so then you've got a plan for your essay. Okay, I'm going to put forward all the contradictory evidence to begin with of all the different brain regions, how people would speak to solve the riddle, and then I'm going to put forward the solution that's been produced by this guy. But then if I want to be critical, what should I put after that? So it looks like I've solved the problem. Yeah. Yeah, so you should do that. Yeah, you should, you should look critically at how it's been solved and bring in the voices of people that disagree with it. So when you, when you cite forward on web of knowledge, do you know what I'm talking about? Cite forward on web of science, or web of knowledge, it's called both for some reason. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, oh, right, OK, I'm going to spend five minutes on that now then. But, but when you look at um, who has cited that, tape, that paper, you will find out that some people don't agree with it, probably. And so you can bring in other voices, um, and at the end, sum up nicely by saying, but there are other theories, and we still haven't solved it, there are these limitations, and there's this contradictory evidence. And then you have that critical aspect that we were talking about before. I think I'd better tell you about Web of Knowledge, just to make sure. Um, oh, God. I keep doing the YouTube thing. Right. Um, so...
the fount of all knowledge for me is the web of science, or sometimes called the web of knowledge. And if you go to the library site, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, then underneath here, find books, articles and more, recommended databases, and right at the bottom of this is Web of Science core collection, which is the database that I use. You can use Google Scholar and other ones. Um, I have arguments with people about what's best. I guess I'm sort of used to this one. But if you're if you're interested in your topic, you could just write your topic in there. So if your topic is stress, put stress in, but that's going to bring up not just neuroscience and stress. It's going to bring up um, critical theory of stress or sociology of stress and stuff like that which you really don't want. So you might put in stress brain. Um, if you're looking at stress and learning, you might put in stress brain learning memory. Sounds a bit more like it. I didn't actually put in I don't think you have to put in yeah you don't have to put in and for some reason. I don't I don't know why. It doesn't seem to be necessary. And they come out ordered in terms of date. At the moment they are a little bit there's a little bit too many of them for me. I'm wondering if I might I'm wondering if I might do something at another field. Publication name. I'd love to have a review on this area. Now there, there are journals that have the word review in them, so any article in that journal will be a review article. Um, in, in neuroscience, they tend to be called trends, actually, so there's the trends in cognitive neuroscience, there are trends in, in behavioural science, things like that. So if I put in trends, I think I have to put in a star to say that's not the whole name. Oh, that's interesting, actually. But not what I want. <laughs> that's the trouble, you see, you go off. You go off, don't you? Stress and multiple memory systems. Oh, that might be interesting. It's also a highly cited paper, so it's probably a very important one. It's quite, quite recent, February 2013. Now, you can look at the actual paper itself by going to full text options, pressing on Get It. They give you a few options, in this case I've only given us one. Press on that. And it should take me to the journal article. I can just download the PDF of that. There we are. And if I download that, it'll give me the whole article as a PDF. But if I go back to here, you'll also see that it says number 58 times cited. So that's telling me which articles have since cited this one. So if I think that this is relevant, all these other articles who have cited it since this was published are probably also relevant, and they're more up to date. <coughs> so if I click on that, that's, this is called a forward search, I'm probably going to see other things that may be of interest. Ooh, stress and memory, a selective review on recent developments in the understanding of stress hormone effects on memory and their clinical relevance. Not sure about clinical relevance, but actually the first part of that article might be of interest to me. So this could be really useful. So as well as forward searching, of course, you've also got the standard um, backward searching because you can look at all the references that are in this article. So as well as 58 times cited, it says 80 cited references within this article. So this will give me some older references as well. And the other thing that I would think about at this stage is using citation software. I use EndNote 
but there are other ones available. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's a good thing to get into now. Uh, because when you're using this sort of searching, all you have to do um, is click on that button. There's an online version of EndNote and there's a desktop version. You can choose which one, but if you click on that button, it automatically downloads the citation into your, into your library. Um, and you can cite as you write and just insert the citation. Um, and it makes life a lot easier, so you don't have to write out references in your bibliography, they just arrive there automatically. It's a really good thing to get into. Anyway, so that's a way in which you can get in contact with the literature, because you do need to be looking at the journals. I'm afraid the books are out of date almost as soon as they're published. Um, I mean, I, I, this book has just come out. I'll, I'll get one for the library. It's particularly of interest. It should be to the neuroscience people. But, but um, from the laboratory to the classroom, translating science and learning for teachers. I wrote a chapter in this, but I'm thinking I'm actually a bit embarrassed about this chapter now because I started writing it like two or three years ago, and it's like it's, it feels so out of date. And this is this is the trouble with with, with books. Whereas you go to the, the e-journals, and these get published so quickly now. I mean, I think in education it sort of still takes two or three years to get a paper published, but in neuroscience, your paper is actually online with, within like two months of, of you submitting it. It's, it's unbelievable that the speed of these things now. Um, you know, that will be a first, not a first draft, but like a, it still has to be proofread and um, you know, it's still got to be corrected for paper publication, but people can read your research straight away. So this is the place to get the up-to-date information. Right, we did digress a little bit there, but I think that was important. Are there any questions about that? Good. Yeah, there are papers as well on Blackboard under uh, most of these topics that I've put there. Okay, so there's like a download button, I call it downloadable library. I should be telling that actually, because I'm not sure I've got I'm sure I've covered on the copy ones. Um, but you, but it, uh, no one's noticed. Right, so you have to be very careful about cause. This is something I think we ought to think about. We ought to be talking about cause. And cause is a dangerous uh, word to have in your essay um, because it's it's a, it's a complex, it's a very complex area. You know, it's, it's very difficult to be aware of cause, um, to, to, sorry, to prove cause, and you have to be very careful of not casually implying it by using certain phrases and words. Um, I'm going to go more into that in, 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 in detail in a few minutes. Just before I leave these comments, you do get nice comments as well, because I've only shown you the negative ones, right? So I'll make sure that I'm, I'm saying some nice things as well. Okay. Um, a little bit more in depth about the essay, and I realise that's a bit of a distance away now, and you're probably, you're probably more thinking about the poster at the moment. Um, do think about the structure of your essay. You can start thinking about that as you're doing your poster, that's the idea. Um, be you have to be incredibly concise to get your, to get your main arguments into 2,000 words. Um, use diagrams to indicate the location of brain regions and explain the processes, all the relevant features, no, no irrelevant ones. Explain the meaning of studies. What is the activation telling us? What does that bit do? And mention the limitations of studies. This is what we were talking about in terms of writing critically. At the end, I really like you to just put a little bullet points as a sort of summary. If you can. <coughs> it seems a really helpful way of doing it. That summary should not be about, there is very much more to know. Um, this is a fascinating area, I've learnt a lot from this. I'm not interested in that. What I want to know is, you know, what do we have evidence for, what do we not have evidence for? There shouldn't really be any references in that summary. All the references should be in the body of the essay. But think about it as you're, you're, it's a lift or an elevator pitch. You're going up in the elevator with somebody and they say, well, what did you find out in your 2,000 words? 
Well, I found out that um, dyslexia is a reading disorder with biological correlates, um, but the causes, um, you know, I, I mean, the, do the dominant theory is phonological deficit, blah, 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 blah. That's what should be in the summary. Always link the neural processes to cognition. Don't get so blinded by the neuroscience that you know, you're worrying about the neuroscience, you're worried about getting it correct, and you're not thinking about what it means. It's what it means that we're most interested in. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. You use the same diagram as you have in the post. Um, this is an example of, of someone writing in an essay, and it, it's really intelligent writing. It's a really nice piece of writing, um, but it, it never tells us, it never explains to us how these brain regions could actually explain anything about autism. It says um, reduced size of the hippocampus could be a possible cause of um, epilepsy, but it may also be uh, a possible centre for autism. Its relation to autism could be chemical. Um, well, why? What does the hippocampus do? What are the symptoms in autism that that might explain? It's not clear to me reading that. Yes? So when you say because the hippocampus is related to mental autism, do you then have to reference that point as well? No, because I suspect that that will already have been discussed in these papers actually. So you're really just reflecting the arguments that are put forward in these papers. Uh, then then I, I get a whole section like this. Um, catecholamines, catelcystokinin, vasopressin, serotonin acting through 5-HT2 receptors. I don't know what a 5-HT2 receptor is, I have to confess. Um, you know, I, I, I need to have this explained to me, not just so that I understand it, which would be nice, I can become enriched, but, but also because I need to know that you understand it. So this sort of jargon really sets off my alarm bells. Um, proofread for sense. You may have missed out some really important words that makes it difficult for me to understand. I can't then give you credit for understanding it if I can't read it properly. Um, there are professional proofreaders that you can hire uh, if you don't have an English speaking friend who can, can look at it. Somebody with English as their first language is very important. Um, conclusions and summaries should distill the key points. Don't leap into new territory. You know, this is, this is what I meant. The, the summary is not about you saying, um, Based on my review, I now think the government should enrol, you know, <coughs> roll out a policy of free school meals for. What, uh, that's, I don't, I don't want to know that. I want to have a summary of the scientific review. <coughs> okay, I think that is just basically a good summary. But you can go to the go to the slides and see that. Now this is a problem, you don't have to read this, all you have to know is that this was put in an essay as a quote, right, there's a, there's a quote, there's an inverted commas here and there's inverted commas down there, avoid quotes, right, I, I really would not put any quotes in your essay at all, right, I, I realise particularly if English is not your first language that you're thinking, but I could never put it better than this person has written it. And I, I understand that feeling, but I need to see you express it, because that's how I gauge your understanding. So I would just avoid quotes like the plague, really. They're, they're not needed in this essay at all. And I, and I can't give any credit for that. You know, that's basically words lost out of the essay, because I have no idea whether the student understands that or not. Um, I should probably say, if they hadn't put those inverted commas in as well, it would be in front of a plagiarism panel straight away. You know, as it, as it is, it's just kind of sloppy writing because it's all quotes. But if, 
it, you know, if you if you start putting in cut and paste comments without inverted commas, um, you know, th that's a very f fast way of, of, of getting in front of a plagiarism panel. Can I just say about plagiarism, all these essays go through this software and it's incredibly good at, at picking up phrases that have been cut and pasted. So never, you know, never cut and paste. Even, now this sounds a bit extreme, but even if you're giving a list of brain regions that somebody else has put in their paper and you feel the need to reproduce exactly this list of brain regions, I would still swap the brain regions around. <laughs> because otherwise it will come up in the plagiarism software as contributing to your plagiarism score. You know, and once that score crosses a certain threshold, threshold, there's nothing I can do about it. And I've had this problem in this department, I have to say, because as far as I'm concerned, I haven't got any problem with you cutting and pasting a list of brain regions, but you're in a social science department, and they don't always understand, um, you know, they don't always understand that my arguments when I say, but it's a list of brain regions, it doesn't make any difference if, if what order they arise in. So what was the problem in cutting and pasting it? But that, that argument will not carry. So don't cut and paste anything, please, all right? Sorry, a question. That's fine. It's just, like you said, the word or the Yeah, I mean, you know... In those terms, in terms Yeah, I mean, theoretically. Yeah, yeah, you have to be very careful. I mean, you know, I think all of us, including myself, quite often, this is a terrible confession to make, maybe I shouldn't do it on YouTube, but you cut and paste something, sometimes a sentence, from another author into your work, and you make a little mental note to say, I must put that in my own words when I get there. You know, and then, but then you forget, right? It's a very dangerous thing to do. Yeah, so don't, you know, try, try not to do it. Or be very careful. I think now there is a, a way of actually um, sort of doing a, a pre-check, isn't there? Isn't there? And getting a plagiarism score before you actually finally submit. You've been told there isn't. It's really annoying. Uh, Yeah, okay. Is there not one on Google or something? A plagiarism checker on Google that you can check? No, no, but I think there is some. Well, okay. Okay, well, most important thing is just don't cut and paste anything, really. Um, yeah, use diagrams to explain. If you mention a region, show where it is. Make sure that your arguments are complete. Use primary sources. Do, yeah, use primary sources. So that w w if there's a review, uh, you need to go to the literature in that review and read that and reference <coughs> that. Okay. Don't keep referencing the review. Say, oh well, you know, the review's dealt with it. It's all in the review. I'll keep referencing that review. You must reference the primary sources that actually created the evidence, that collected the data and created the evidence, yes? Would you say the same about um, meta-analysis studies? Uh, um, not really, because I mean the meta-analysis will come to a conclusion based on a, a, on a quantitative um, analysis of like 164 studies. So that is, that, that finding is the property of that meta-analysis, you know what I mean? So you don't have to reference all 164 studies. I, I, I'd be very dubious um, of using any secondary sources, really. You know, unless, unless it's in the, the opinion, sometimes... Yeah, exactly. Why use a textbook? I don't think you should be... You see, I don't think you should be referencing textbooks, no. Personally, I don't think you should be referencing textbooks. I think you should be referencing the primary research because this this is about going to the primary research. 
And one of the favourite things, uh, one of my, my, my sort of, I have this a lot, is, is, is students thinking that because I've said something, maybe in a lecture, they'll reference my lecture, right? That's no good. You've got to reference the research that says it, not, not my lecture. And then often they reference my papers a lot because they think, I suppose, that I'm going to be flattered by that. <laughs> and I'm going to give them a better grade. The problem with referencing my papers is that I know what's in my papers. And that I, you know, I've, my contribution to the world of neuro neuroscience is, is, is very small, very, very small. Um, you know, probably less than most neuroscientists because I have to work, I work in education as well as neuroscience. But, you know, the chances of me being so relevant that I can be referenced in your essay five or six times is probably unlikely, I would say, you know? So, be aware of that one. Okay, that's, that's pretty much everything. I just wanted to say something very briefly about cause, but before we go on to that, we've got any questions? Yes? Uh, I was going to ask you, um, give a sort of critical Yes. Yeah, so, well, I don't know. It depends, really. Um, it depends. If you're doing a whole theory, like if, you're, if you're just focusing on uh, one theory of autism, then uh, there might be there might be a case for peppering them to make clear the limitations of each um, piece of evidence that's supporting that theory. Or you might decide to do a critique at, right at the end, saying. You know, well, this is all well and good. Depends how it reads, really. As long as they're in there, I don't really mind. You know, depends whatever feels more comfortable. <laughs> cause is not an easy word. It's popular used to be laughable if it was not so dangerous, informing as it does government policy on matters that affect us all. There is no single cause of anything, and nothing is determined. And that is John Morton, um, who is a cognitive neuroscientist. He's not a sociologist. But scientists themselves understand that causes of human behaviour, human disorders, very complex things. So be very wary of it. Newspapers, very quick, and the public, very quick to talk about cause. Um, and, you know, this is, and these brain differences could be a cause rather than a consequence of dyslexia. Something until, something unknown until now. I very much doubt if that's what the Journal of Neuroscience actually said. Um, but you know that's the way it's become. Now it's gone on to BBC News Online. They actually do some pretty awful stories. Actually, BBC Online News. Uh, they appear a lot in my slides as examples of bad journalism. <laughs> I've got a friend who, who works there, so I shouldn't be too rude. But oh, it's on YouTube again. So I forget. Um, yeah, you, you're going to come across this in a language uh, lecture on, on Monday. I'm going to be talking about what causes the the Brobman areas. Brobman areas are not in your test, I'll remind you that one. Um, but what causes uh, all these different regions in, in the brain, that aerial structure that can be marked out in terms of um, cell differences, differences for example in the texture, the granularity of the, of the cells. Um, is it you know, due to uh, intrinsic factors, some sort of innate causes, or is it actually something that depends on the external environment and, and input. Um, I'm not going to go very much into, into this because I'm going to be talking about it um, next week. But um, in the end, we decide that <coughs> biological structures emerge from a complex interaction of genes and the environment. That's the way you should talk about it. We, we never in our essays now talk about, is it nature or is it nurture? We've got beyond that. The, 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 the problem is we all know it's an interaction of nature and nurture and it's a complex one so that's how you should be talking about, about it um, and you know we've dealt with neuroconstructivism we've dealt with that idea that small changes early on in development when the marble is rolling down the mountain actually can bring about large changes <coughs> later on um, and the consequences of taking that neuroconstructivist point of view is that things are probabilistic. You know, we can say this increases the chance or reduces the chance. 
we know that external environmental effects are very important, particularly common stimuli like faces and um, landscapes, things that the brain may have evolved to be, to be ready to respond to. Um, we know also that uh, since the cortex is uh, plastic and it responds to input, input, one region will respond to input from other regions, then you know, atypicality in one region can produce atypicality in another region. But we also know that brain systems may be more important than cortical differences. So that's why I say with ADHD, dopamine deficit theory is quite important because um, changes in levels of midbrain dopamine, that's going to interact with a whole range of different cortical regions and could explain differences in the cortex. Whereas trying to say that differences in the cortex explain differences in the underlying systems, that's, that's a lot more dodgy, really. Um, so brain systems are particularly important rather than just cortical differences because the cortex is so plastic. And different types of initial atypicality, like a difference in, in the reward system, could bring about um, different outcomes and maybe even different disorders. So it's complicated is what I'm basically saying. Um, and you need to write with caution. And when you're writing with caution, you need to be aware of the strength of your statements. And some statements are more dangerous than others. Uh, and, and some statements, you know, some evidence, you can be more confident in terms of its interpretation than, than other forms of evidence. And you need to think about that when you're writing. So, for example, think about these phrases. So a little exercise for you now I'd like you to do. Um, talk amongst yourselves, I'm sure you will. Put those statements in order of strength. That you could have written any of these statements, but are you aware of how strong they are? The difference between them. And just, just to check your awareness, I just want you to put them in order of strength. Put the most put the strongest one first, going down to the to the weakest one.
Right. I mean, what, I think one of the things you can see straight away looking at these. I think the first word, oh, well, third word. This this word here, the verb here, actually is very important. Um, and you can you can use these words in your essay. I mean, considers, suggests, states, proposes, draws attention to. Those are actually all different levels of. Know, certainty, if you like, of strength, anyway. Um, this one here, states, if you use states in your essay, um, I mean, I'm almost, I'm, I'm all, you know, my attention will be drawn to that straight away, because it's a very, very strong phrase, um, and I'm not sure really that any scientist should be stating that something is the truth. Um, you know, they, most of the time, to be honest, <coughs> proposing, you know, that's about as strong as they get, frankly. And uh, when they're just exploring an idea, and they're being very, very gentle with it, they might be just drawing attention to the possibility. So I would, I put them in this order, really. Fox states that the only way of understanding, the only way of understanding, exclusive belief, an exclusive belief. There's no other theory that's possibly going to be able to explain this. So this is just ridiculously strong, and I think a scientist would only come out with that if they were caught off guard by a journalist and they were in a really bad mood. Because it's not allowing any discussion. <laughs> um, Fox considers that the best way of understanding, even that is quite brave, because what he's saying there, there are other theories, and maybe they explain, but this is the, this is the best one, you know. But it's still, at least, um, the person who's writing this is saying it's Fox's opinion. Um, Fox suggests that a useful way of understanding sounds a little bit more, maybe it's helpful, maybe it's not. He's only suggesting. Proposes that one way of understanding is through the use of socially, uh, oh, sorry. Actually, this is, these have been slightly changed. I do apologise for that. I didn't, I didn't update it. Uh, but the weakest way is definitely that draws attention to the possibility of understanding. That has to be the, the weakest of the lot. Sorry, this is the one I I've obviously not deleted that previous slide. <laughs> I've realised that. Um, the, weakest, the, the weakest one of all is when he draws attention to the possibility of understanding imitation is through, is through a model based on the mirror neural system. So he, I'm not even sure that he's actually proposing it there. The reason I've presented these to you is because I want you to be sensitised to the different ways in which you can imply the strength of a claim. Scientists, makes all, scientists make all sorts of claims, but they usually make them alongside some sense of strength of the claim. And you need to be sensitive to that when you're, when you're reading literature, and you need to be sensitive to that when you're writing the literature as well. Um, and so, you know, be thinking about words like states, considers, proposes, suggests, drawing attention to. Those sort of phrases are helpful in expressing different levels of, of strength of the claim. Um, and just, you know, there's a few more helpful words here that you might want to put in. Possibly, I'm always putting in possibly. Uh, related to, rather than saying it's, it's caused by, you might say it's related to because it's quite often bi-directional and you don't know which direction it's travelling. If you're saying that differences in left hemisphere language regions are activated or under-activated, let's say, with dyslexia, and you want to talk about a possible connection, maybe you can say that they are related to, maybe you can say they're linked with, maybe you can say they're associated with, None of those things 
say that the brain difference is causing dyslexia or that dyslexia is causing the brain difference you're leaving that open because actually both of those things may be true it's very very often the case is a bi-directional relationship between the mind and the brain okay so be very careful when you're talking about cause and these sorts of phrases can be very helpful um, and these are the sort of words that ring alarm bells when I see this these words in your essay ding a ling a ling a ling a ling and I'll be looking very closely at what you've written proves that whew, you know how many things have we how much evidence do we have that proves anything it's you know without any sense of disbelief in science yeah yeah suggests proposes possibly linked with associated with may provide insight into all of those things are fine <clears throat> when you start saying proves that my alarm bells go off um, due to there's lots of casual ways in which you can say cause and you're not even aware you're saying it due to giving rise to um, I've already said proves no good resulting in determined by depends on all of those are really saying cause and I may also be getting my red pen out on those and saying, hang on, what about the mind? What about attitudes? What about motivation? What about the, the, the freely willed actions of the learner bringing about brain differences? Maybe it's not all about the brain causing behaviour. Maybe the behaviours are causing the brain differences. Okay, any final questions? I can hear the next lot waiting to come in. Sir. Yes, you can pick the same topic area, I think, without any conflict. Um, but, yeah, but be aware that essays that are, yeah, so obviously one needs to be focusing on cognition, one needs to be focusing on the neuroscience. But be aware <coughs> that those, both those essays will go through the plagiarism software. So if anything's lifted, it will show up immediately. But there's nothing wrong with you focusing on the, your same topic of interest. You have to a bit, yeah, yeah. A term. What? Uh, yeah, is it an EEG study? Yeah. Maybe can we have a chat about that at the end? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Yeah, APA is good. Well, you're supposed to choose the most up-to-date, so it's the latest one if you can. But we're not going to disqualify you if you use any APA. Really. Okay. How close? Oh, <coughs> you. We are supposed to take it into account if it is above or below 10% from the workout. But but I should say that. I don't know what the other units do, but I'm always a bit casual about whether I include the references or not. So I, I tend to include references according to whatever benefits you, <coughs> as it were. No, the bibliography at the end, the big bibliography at the end. Yeah. Anybody not signed the register, please do so. Sorry? Yes. Very nice to see you all. I'll be seeing you on Monday. It won't be long. Uh, if you Google Paul Howard Jones YouTube, it's on my YouTube channel. Okay. Thank you.
do loads of positioning in scan. I'm being, I'm being facetious, but that is the problem. There just aren't enough FMRI studies or digital studies. So it's sort of a nervous You can do it there. There's enough, there's enough meditation studies, yeah. Yeah, it's true. But that's not really in the exercise, and that's a very complex area. Um, the mind work deals with the default mode network, which is supposed to be very important in uh, meditation. Uh, so it might be a good place to introduce yourself to the brain. I'm done. I'm just thinking about, you know, dyslexia and memory. Right. Yeah. Yes, but I mean, I think this is the, the, it's like I was just focusing on dyslexia and then including, you know, some paragraphs that are really in your particular focus language. So based on early reading and dyslexia, and then maybe just make a comment about memory, or can I do just memory? Yes, then make a comment about memory at the end. So, early reading and dyslexia. I would. I'm I'm not sure actually. Um, there was a study I was using as an overview that was um, a meta analysis of lots of different sections. seem to be a smaller group. I wonder where that is. Why, why would that be, I wonder? I don't know. Um, so there's a register going around. If you can just